This is the online version of Trinity Fellowship Church's Sunday School class, April 16th through July 16th, based on Kerry Kirkwood's book, The Power of Right Thinking. Chapter 1. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first lesson from this book, The Power of Right Thinking. This is going to be the content for our Sunday School class at Trinity Fellowship Church from April 16th all the way to July 16th. And we'll be covering all 13 chapters, one chapter per week. God bless you and welcome. And I want to start this session with prayer. I believe the blessings of the Lord are upon my life today. I believe that I have divine health in my body, my mind, my soul, and my spirit. I believe I have peace in my heart. I believe I have favor with God and man. I believe that I have the power of the Holy Spirit on me today and on all of us today as we study the scriptures about the power of right thinking. And we believe these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we go. Chapter one of this great book, The Power of Right Thinking, uh, has several ideas, but I want to concentrate on the main idea, the big fish in this chapter. And that comes out of the scripture from 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. And most of you know this scripture. I'm in the New King James Version here. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 4 and 5. And the portion of this scripture that captivated me as I was reading through this chapter and allowing the teachings from the chapter to change my heart was bringing every thought into captivity in the obedience of Jesus Christ. Every thought. Because I don't know about you, but there are times in my life where my thoughts are not guided by the Holy Spirit that's in me. Um, you know, you get up in the morning you start your day, you start thinking, right? And you're thinking just about the steps that it takes, the routines in the morning, and then where are you gonna go, what you have to do with that day. You might be in a work environment, you might be retired, you might be in a family environment, whatever environment you're in for that day, your brain, once it wakes up in the morning, begins to focus on what to do that day. And these are all important thoughts, and all, they're all necessary. You know, our mind has to be plugged into what we're doing, <laughs> how to drive the car, you know, how to prepare our breakfast and so on. <clears throat> but what I have been led to do over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, I don't know when I started this, but I know I have been doing this every single morning for the last bunch of years. And it's been such a blessing to me because this little devotional that I get into helps to keep my thoughts captive in obedience to Jesus Christ. One of my heroes in the Bible is Joshua. He was a military guy. And the night before, he was going to lead his army against this fortified city of Jericho. In chapter 5 of the book of Joshua, Joshua the general of the army and the spiritual and political leader of the nation of Israel, Joshua, he goes out by himself to a deserted place, probably within sight of the walls of the city that he's going to attack the next day. He goes out there by himself at night and he sees what appears to be a man with a sword in his hand. He's, you would think that he would be terrified or at least um, ready to do battle, which he, he might have been. But he challenges this man and he says, are you for us or are you for our enemies? 
And the man with the sword answers, neither. And then Joshua begins to realize who this is. And he says this sentence, and this is the question that I want to center on in this portion of scripture. He says, what does my Lord have to say to his servant? Now the answer in the Bible is, take off your sandals because the place on which you stand is holy. And most of us remember where we've heard that before in our study of Moses in the burning bush. The voice of God says that. So now Joshua recognizes that this is the captain of the heavenly host. This is the Lord. So he falls on his face in reverence. And what I have been doing now as my morning devotional is asking God that same question. <clears throat> what does the Lord have to say to his servant? But what I do when I take a position in reverence to my captain, my leader, my Lord, is I take the position of attention, which I learned back in 1966 when I entered the military and I went into the military through the United States Military Academy at West Point. And they taught us the position of attention. It's very, very precise. It's not just some accidental, casual way to stand. Here's how you do it. You put your heels together and you hold your toes apart at a 45 degree angle. You cup your fingers loosely like this and you hold your thumbs straight down and you hold your thumbs along the seams of your trousers. So you have your heels together, your feet apart, your thumbs are pointing toward the ground behind the themes of your trousers, seams of your trousers. You have your chest out, your stomach in, and your eyes are straight ahead. Your head doesn't move. Your eyes do not move because you are directing all your attention at your commanding officer. This position is taken when you're in a formation of 10 people or 100 people or 1,000 people, and there's a commander, a senior person at the front of the formation, and all of your attention is on that senior person. This position is also taken, the position of attention, when you are in a formal setting and you're one-on-one -on -one with a senior commander, maybe in his office maybe on the company street, maybe on the parade ground. And you stand at the position of attention. So this is the position I come to the first thing every morning. And I direct all my energy, my spiritual energy, my emotional energy, my intellectual energy, my physical energy, my eyes, my ears, all my senses. on the Spirit of God that is in the room. And I ask him this question. I say, what does my Lord have to say to his servant? And I wait. And I wait. And at a point that I cannot describe in words, the Spirit of the Lord speaks to my spirit, the spirit of the man. I don't hear it with my ears. I don't understand it with my intellect or my soul. But my spirit receives my instructions from the Lord from the dead. And I trust him in that. I trust the Lord that he's spoken to my spirit and I go do what I have to do. That's how I set my affections on things above, not on things on earth below, because we are dead and we are risen in Christ our Lord. It's set. It's like setting a uh, temperature on your gauge at your house. 70 degrees, 68 degrees, 65 degrees. It's like setting a gauge. It's like setting your direction on a compass. I set my affections on God. And I trust 
that he has instructed me over all, and he continues to instruct me by the power of the Holy Spirit. Taking captive every thought. That's how I begin my day. Now, I find myself thinking about what I'm thinking <laughs> as I go through my daily life, you know. And I may be driving in the car, and I'm wondering, gee, did I take a right or a left up here, or uh, do I have enough gas, or whatever I'm thinking, you know, just to get me from point A to point B, and maybe what I'm going to be doing when I get to my destination. And I think about what I'm thinking. And I say, Lord, what do you think about this? Lord, what, what, what do you think? I want your thoughts about these moments in my day my destination, who I'm going to see, what you have in mind for what I'm supposed to do with this gift of the day that you've given me. And then I go on and, you know, continue with my day and I keep catching myself. And here's the thing, you can train yourself to get better and better at this. Because the bottom line is, yes, we need to think and yes, our own intellect is important. But if we try to figure out the important things of our life only by our minds and not tapping into our spiritual intellect that's connected with the spirit, spirit of God because our spirits have been awakened when we were born again, if we neglect to do that, we're not really finding God's will for these moments, for these days, for our life, for our destiny. So. We begin the day with a routine, and if you don't have a routine yet, I highly suggest that you get one. You don't have to grab a hold of this kind of weird one that I have because I've spent 23 years in the military, and I've stood at attention <laughs> more often than people have stood in the child line, but pick some comfortable way. I know some people can pray for a full hour and focus that whole hour on their prayers before God, and then maybe again at noon and again at night. Uh, other people have different things they do, a devotional reading or a scripture reading or whatever that is. If you have one, I want to encourage you that you would renew that and intensify that morning routine. If you don't have one, get one, because we want to keep all of our thoughts captive in obedience to Christ. Um, you know, another area in my life that I have trouble with in my thought life is the time, you know, I'm, I get too tired around 10, 10.30 at night to really do anything constructive. So I, I lay down in bed, but I'm not tired enough to completely go to sleep. Maybe some of you are familiar with that time. And during that time, if you're like me, your thoughts are just like random thoughts. And if you're thinking about what you're thinking, you're going, what in the world? I'm remembering this from today. I'm thinking about that for tomorrow. I've, I go back to when I was 11 years old or, you know, my army career or my preaching career. What, bup, 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 and it's going all kind of directions. I said, wait a minute. I want to keep captive my thoughts, especially now. Because when I do finally go off to sleep, I want to be focused on you. And that will calm my dream life and offer my sleep time to the Holy Spirit to re-energize what my mind is going to do for the next day, month, or year. So what I, I do two things in order to uh, calm my chaotic, cluttered thought life in those moments between when I lie down in bed and when I go to sleep. Number one, I find a word of God. Uh, just from memory, you know, all of us have memorized certain scripture, and that's great. You know, um, Joshua 1.8 was one that came to mind early in my prayer life. And I just say it in my mind, this book of the law shall not depart from your lips, day or night, but thou shalt observe to do all that's written therein, and then you will have good success. And nine says something like, take courage, be courageous, B 
Be not afraid. For I, the Lord, the God, am with you always. Uh, 23rd Psalm, uh, Genesis 1, uh, John 3, 16. Uh, whatever sections of Scripture that God has allowed you to memorize in your mind, just bring them to mind. Because doesn't Romans chapter 12, verse 2 say that the mind is renewed by the word of God, renewing the mind by the word of God. So now you've got that going on in your thought life before you go to bed. And you and you've pushed out all those random chaotic thoughts. You, 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 you filled up your mind with the word of God so there's no room for these unnecessary, somewhat troubling sometimes thoughts. The other thing that we have uh, to connect with the intelligence of the spirit, which we're gonna talk about more and more in the following Bible studies. The spirit has an own, its own set of high intelligence and the spirit's intelligence is much higher than your emotional soul intelligence your intellectual mind intelligence, or certainly your body's intelligence, all of which have a certain amount of intelligence, but your spiritual intelligence. So you, you, you've activated that with the power of the Word of God. Now, because we are filled with the Holy Spirit, and because we believe in the power of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we can speak in tongues. And so when we speak in tongues, according to the Bible, that's because the Holy Spirit is speaking in a language for us. So it's a spiritual language that's going on in our spiritual intelligence. And that is a wonderfully purifying, organizing way to keep our thoughts captive in obedience with Jesus Christ. So this is a short preview and, and kind of an introduction of the first chapter of the book, The Power of Right Thinking. And I can't wait till next week when we look at chapter two. So I thank you for coming together with us for this Bible teaching. And what we're going to do now in the class is we're going to turn the recorder off and we're going to have a discussion. And people are going to give us their input and back and forth. And what I'd like you to do, because you're watching this online, is put a comment somewhere. Um, I've got this now on my YouTube channel, so there's a place for comments there. And if you agree, disagree, or have a testimony about your thought life and how you want it to change, whatever you want to put in the comments, I welcome them. You may put comments on my Facebook page, um, but that, and go ahead, if, if that's the best way you can respond. Um, sometimes that gets a little muddled because people come in with crazy things. And I will delete any comment that's not life-giving in the Facebook page. And the third way is, you know, you can private message me your comments about this portion of, of uh, our book, The Power right thinking, transform your thoughts, transform your world. May God bless you. May God purify your thought life and bring you more mental energy. And that will give you physical energy, spiritual energy, emotional energy. And may God bless you with all the blessings from heaven. In Jesus' name.